Hi there, and welcome back to Toxic Bliss, Surviving Narcissism, with me, Eowyn Reese. In the last episode, we learned that Mike's disappearance was a result of him being arrested in a domestic issue with his ex-wife, Tina. The minute he got out of jail, he called me and rocked my world once again. Today we'll talk about how I reacted, and if I decided to take him back, or if I ran away screaming. Before we begin, it's time once again for that all-important disclaimer. I am not a psychologist, psychiatrist, or mental health professional. If you need help, or if you're in a dangerous situation, please reach out. I urge you to call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Their advocates are available 24-7 at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. All the calls are free and confidential. You can also reach them online at www.thehotline.org. This episode might be a little longer than usual, so let's just jump right into it. Mike had called me and told me about his arrest and time in jail. Back then, I had no idea of the inner workings of the criminal justice system, and I couldn't see the glaring holes in his story. I assumed what he had told me was the truth. After that phone call, I went straight to bed. I did not go online to see if Mike had managed to log in. I didn't want to talk to him yet. Although his words were those that I had longed to hear, it just felt like an assault on my cognitive processes. He spoke so rapidly and continuously that I couldn't get a thought in edgewise, let alone a word. I slept the sleep of the dead that night. No dreams, no stirring, no tossing or turning. I think my brain just turned itself off in self-defense. The phone woke me up the next morning, and I struggled into consciousness as I reached over to make that horrible noise stop. Good morning, sunshine! You weren't online last night. I was sad. I stayed up late waiting for you. Ugh, sing-song voices at the crack of dawn are annoying, no matter who's on the other end of the phone. Instant headache. Give me a minute to wake up, I said. I have to pee. Hang on. I walked to the bathroom and I put the phone down on the bookcase in the hallway. I wasn't about to pee while talking to someone. As I set the phone down, I could still hear him talking, but at least in that moment... I didn't care what he was saying. I came out of the bathroom a minute later and picked up the phone, and he was still talking. I don't think he realized that I was gone. Stop, I said, trying to get his attention. But he continued. Mike, stop, I tried again, and still he continued. Mike, I yelled, and he stopped abruptly. I was pretty sure I'd pay for that later, but it was worth it for a moment of silence. Listen, I said. This is a big deal for me. I have a lot of questions that I need answered, and I'm really confused. I don't know what I'm feeling or thinking, and I need to just chill the flip out for a minute. There was a brief second of silence before, Well, if you don't want me to call you anymore, just say so. Jeez, he whined. Well, really, can you not do that right now? You just upended my whole world again, and I need to catch up, okay? I'm sorry. I tried to adopt a more gentle tone because I did want to talk to him, just not like a hyperactive cartoon character. Slow down. Let's work through this together. I have questions, I said as gently as I could. Fine, he sighed as if I was taking all the wind out of his sails. It was really hard for me when you didn't show up that weekend. And then I had no word from you at all. I had no idea what happened. I thought maybe you were dead or... You just decided to dump me and didn't even bother telling me. It was a nightmare. And he replied, I know, I know, I read all of your emails you sent while I was in jail. Dope! I had forgotten all about those. Well, if he read them, then at least he knows what I was going through. What did you think about them? He said that they were really long, so he just kind of skimmed them, but clearly it was a rough time for me. But not as rough as being locked up for three months. Didn't I want to hear about what he was going through? And I stayed silent again. Of course, I wanted to hear about what he went through. I, I did love him, and I cared that he had had a traumatic experience. But right this moment, I did not want to hear about what he went through. I wasn't ready to think about anyone but myself, or rather, I wasn't capable of thinking about anyone yet but myself. While I was busy thinking about thinking, he continued to rabbit on about his time in the hole, and how terrible it was, and he had lost weight, but he worked out a lot, so he was looking great. He told me about the TV shows he watched, and 
some of the people he met and the books he read from the little library they had. From what I could hear, it didn't sound all that traumatic to me. I mean, aside from having your freedom revoked, of course. He didn't get into any fights or anything, and he was in a low-risk area that was very communal, and everyone was pretty calm. So, do you still love me? He blurted out of nowhere. Yes, I do, I said automatically. Well, good. When can I come see you? Oh, we're doing that again, are we? Nah, I thought to myself. Listen, I said to him. I need to get dressed and get Maggie up and fed and do some things around the house. I'll go online when I'm ready to talk, okay? Just need a few minutes to pull myself together. And I said it as nicely as I could. Fine, he answered and hung up the phone. Oh. Talking to him was dizzying at times. I felt like he was spinning me around so quickly that I couldn't focus on any one thing, and as fast as thoughts would come into my head, they'd disappear, replaced by something else, and I never had a moment to react to any of it. This was, of course, by design, but back then it was simply nauseating. My emotions were all over the place. I was happy that he was back, I was angry that he had been arrested for fighting with Tina, and I was irritated that he wasn't giving me a moment to think. I was also feeling waves of desire and love washing over me again, and that was perhaps the most frightening aspect of all of it. I was thankful for the blessed silence, as I woke Maggie and made us some breakfast. I showered and got dressed slowly, as I was in no real rush to get to the computer to talk to him right now. I sat down on the floor with Maggie and we did some coloring. She was my center, and the love that I felt for her was pure and unadulterated with drama or ulterior motives. It just, it felt so good. I decided on a few simple truths while coloring pages with my sweetest girl. One, I did love Mike. Two, I did want to have a life with him. Three, I understood that I was feeling the pain of his disappearance brought back to life again, and I had to let it out. And four, it was okay for me to focus on me and not have to worry about fixing him. With a renewed sense of clarity and purpose, I felt ready to go talk to him. I gave Maggie an extra hug. Just being around her was the calming force that I needed. I stood up and went to my desk and turned on the computer and sat down, ready to face the rest of my life. It seemed like the instant message from Mike popped up before I was even fully connected. Took you long enough, he typed, with a smiley face, of course. Launching the conversation with a guilt trip wasn't what I had hoped for, but I let it slide. We talked for the whole day. Texting was a much better option, as I could take as much time as I wanted to answer, even though that did result in questions from him about who else I was talking to or why it was taking so long to respond. And my comments were there in text, which means he couldn't pretend he didn't hear me. I was oddly able to think much more clearly without hearing the cadence of his voice as well. The more we talked, the more I could feel the old familiar haze spread across my spirit. I was falling for him all over again, and it felt good. The doubts and fears and concerns were being washed away, and I was lulled back into a state of bliss. And it happened within the span of a few hours. Alternative timeline accepted. All was forgiven and forgotten. Time to move on. The apartment that my husband but really ex shared was coming to the end of its lease. We decided that we wanted to move, but probably somewhere together, as neither of us could afford a comfortable life on one income. I talked this through with Mike, and of course he had a solution. Why don't we all move to Florida? The apartments where he was staying were huge and not very expensive, and if we all lived together we could afford the rent easily and not have any real money issues. It made sense on paper. The thought of living with my ex-husband and my boyfriend under the same roof? That's crazy, right? Yes, that's crazy. But as always, Mike put my fears to rest. My ex and I were still really close and good friends. Surely he'd see the logic in this plan and go with it. If he didn't, well, he could go off on his own. It's not like I was responsible for him. He had a point there. I sat down with Eddie, my ex, and we had a long talk about this. Now, I could do an entire podcast series about this relationship, but I won't. He's a good guy, and I have a lot of affection for him, and he definitely isn't a sociopath, so there's that. His mother, on the other hand, well, that will be a podcast series eventually, so I won't spoil it here. 
Eddie and I decided that this was an interesting idea. He had lived in Florida before, and he liked it there. In fact, his maternal unit still owned property down there, so it would be a sort of homecoming for him. He was sold. We were moving to Florida, baby. I had talked to Mike about getting this all set up. He was able to get me an application from the rental office there, and I sent it to him with a check for the deposit. He would get the apartment all ready, furnished and all, before we headed down there. My plan was to rent a truck, load up our belongings, and drive down. But the problem with this was that I couldn't find a rental truck that would allow for a car seat for my daughter. All of the trucks had two bucket seats in front and no back seat. The car we had wouldn't have survived a trip that long, so we sold it for some quick cash for the move. But now I was a little bit stuck. How best to get us all down there without costing a small fortune? And Mike, of course, had the solution yet again. He would fly up to Connecticut, help Eddie load the truck, and Mike and I would drive the truck down to Florida, and Eddie would follow along later with Maggie and take a train. Well, that certainly was a solution, and I had no alternative, so that became the plan. There were a few wrinkles in this plan, of course. First one being that Mike had no money for a plane ticket, so that was all on me. Kind of reminded me of the collect call fiasco, and I wondered if this was going to become a pattern. I hope not. Timing was a bit of an issue as well. Our lease was about to expire, and it would still take a couple weeks for Mike to get everything set up in Florida. We rented a truck, moved everything into my mother's garage, and stayed with her until Mike could fly up and we could head off. Now, I love my mom don't get me wrong, but living with her as an adult female was, well, let's just say we had an interesting time. It was fun, all told, though, and it felt like vacation, and she was thrilled to have Maggie with her for such an extended visit. We had a lot of cookouts, and Maggie played in a kiddie pool in the yard, and fun things like that. My mother had bought a copy of two Harry Potter books. They had just come out the previous summer, and I hadn't even heard of them yet, but we all started reading them, and I was instantly in love. I read the first book to Maggie during our time at my mom's house. We'd sit outside under a tree, and she'd be spellbound until I was too hoarse to continue reading. This was the beginning of something magical, and I don't mean my relationship with Mike. I mean Harry Potter. To this day, my house is filled with Harry Potter toys, wands, movies, video games, you name it. It's a big part of who we are. When I wasn't knee-deep in the Chamber of Secrets, I was talking to Mike on the phone. He called my mother's house collect once, and, well, that never happened again. We'll leave it at that. I had purchased a plane ticket for him, fully aware that he had already disappeared once after planning to come here, and this time it would cost me more than my sanity if he did it again. So far, I had spent several thousand dollars on this venture, between the cost for the new apartment in Florida, the plane ticket, and a bit of an indulgence. I hired a limousine to take me to the airport to meet Mike. Why? Well, I'm a Leo, remember? And we're show-offs sometimes. We love to spoil the people that we love, and we always do it in style. I was not going to pick him up in my mother's little Chevy Cavalier. That was not style. I was going to set the tone right from the offing. The day had come for Mike to fly up. I woke up early, and I was a bundle of nerves. I skipped breakfast, tried on at least five different outfits, did my hair and makeup, all the while being lectured by my mother, bless her heart. Stranger danger, make sure you come straight back. Don't dilly-dally. Why are you wearing so much makeup? Are you sure the driver knows how to get to the airport? Really, Mom? <laughs> I was eager to escape for a while and waited outside for the limo to appear. The uppity neighbors across the street were gathered outside to see what was going on. I made sure to wave to them as I got in the car. They always acted like they were so much better than everyone else on the street, even though their house was no bigger than anyone else's. They even voiced their concerns about having their daughter play with us uncouth heathens in the neighborhood when we were growing up. I didn't see a limo outside of their house now, did I? Nope. <laughs> yes, I am absolutely a Leo. This was going to be about a 45-minute drive, so I sat on the seat near the driver so we could talk. I was a nervous wreck, and I couldn't stay silent all the way there. He was great and funny, and listened attentively as I told the story of my relationship with Mike. He was quite amused that I'd never seen a picture of him. How was I going to know who to look for at the airport? I said that was a good point, and I didn't know, but we'd figure it out, even if we had to walk around yelling, Mike, Mike. The driver told me that there were some alcoholic drinks in the cooler if I wanted one of them. Calm down. What do you mean? Do I seem nervous? Hyper? Oh my God, am I being obnoxious? 
Was this all a big mistake? Uh, take me home. He just laughed and said, nah, you're fine. Uh, famous last words. We got to the airport and he pulled up in front of the arrivals port. I got out of the limo and immediately saw a man in a lovely pastel striped shirt sitting on the wall with a small bag. I looked at him sideways and he said, hi, baby. It was him. Oh, my God. And he wasn't bad looking at all. My, my. I walked up to him as he had remained seated, and he pulled me close and wrapped his arms around me in a bear hug that lasted for what felt like hours. I never wanted it to end. The driver walked up behind me eventually and tapped me on the shoulder. We had to go. I guess you weren't allowed to park there for an undetermined amount of time while people clogged up the sidewalk hugging. Mike released me and stood up, and he took my hand, and we walked back to the car. The driver opened the door in true fashion, and I smiled at him. I knew he was acting it up for my benefit, and it was awesome. Once we were seated and heading out of the airport, the driver asked me if I wanted to go straight to the house or take the long way home. The long way, please, I replied, and he gave me a thumbs up and raised the privacy screen. Mike fiddled with the overhead music system and found a radio station that was satisfactory. He pulled me right onto his lap and looked deeply into my eyes. Hi, he said with a smile that could have knocked down buildings. I couldn't speak. I made some weird, high-pitched giggle sound, and he just kissed me, just like that, fully and deeply and with a passion that I didn't even know could be experienced. The kissing led to other things, lots of other things, and although I was painfully aware of the presence of the driver, I didn't care. Mike was only the third guy I've ever been with like that, and suddenly I realized what I'd been missing all of my adult days. I always wondered what the big deal was about sex. It didn't seem like such a big deal to me. Until now, oh my God. We spent the rest of the ride home in relative quiet, simply looking at each other and being amazed that we were finally here, finally together. He was so handsome and warm and real. I could not have possibly been happier. This was the missing half of me, and now I was complete. Perfect bliss. I suddenly remembered one of the lectures my mother gave me before I left. I looked at Mike in horror and asked, D Did you wear a, a... He knew exactly what I was asking, and he just laughed. No, but don't you want to have a baby with me? Oh, I did. I very, very, very much did. This perfect man, our perfect life, and a baby to boot? Oh, yes. I tried to interject a little bit of reality and said, you know, that other reality. I'm not even technically divorced yet. We should wait until it's settled and we can get married and all that. And Mike just smiled and said, it'll all happen in time. Legal papers don't make a family. We do. So let's make our own. Sold. Alternate reality three. Bought and paid for. When we arrived back at my mother's house, it was almost a shock. Eddie, Maggie, my mother. That was another reality. Here in the back of this extravagant stretch limo with the man of my dreams, this was the reality I wanted to stay in. I didn't realize how big of a red flag this was. I didn't understand the terrible danger of the schism that I was facing and, in fact, creating. I was lost in an ocean of toxic bliss, and I was just fine with that. And that brings this episode to a close. I think I need a cold shower or a cigarette or something. <laughs> Woo. Tune in to the next episode of Toxic Bliss to see if we can keep this blissful state rolling. Or does the cosmos throw a wrench in it? Thank you for listening and take care. People ask me what my secret is, I just know.